Synthetic cannabinoids, very hard to say. Spice, again, has a multitude of names, which I believe are in your appendix. K2 is another favorite. These are interesting, interesting drugs. Also known as Spice K2 and Incense, first appeared in Europe in 2004, then in the United States in 2008. So are you trying to remember back to the days when Europe gave us things like the Statue of Liberty and the Beatles? <laughs> Let's get back to that. I'm sure it's not their fault. Uh, Europe was also a wonderful band that gave us a song called The Final Countdown. So. There are positive things. From July through November 2010, 35% of samples submitted by juvenile probation were synthetic. So it's becoming very prevalent. 11.4% among 12th graders, second behind marijuana. Again, guys like us were trying to die. Maybe that is an evolutionary thing. Inhal inhalation is the most common, so in other words, smoking. And typically the way this is done, these compounds are something that can be sprayed on a non-active burnable, so in other words, incense. So people actually have used incense, spray your synthetics on there and then smoke it that way. And it's cheap, right, 10 to $20 a gram. Once again, peaked in about 2011 and then started falling off. And again, I think we're kind of thinking that this isn't because spice is going away. It's because people aren't panicking and causing poison control when they see it anymore because they kind of know what it is. And then most people that are seeing it clinically, again, think if anything, it's escalating. Components, these are all synthetic drugs that are designed to mimic THC. And the background on this is that many people have been trying to develop compounds that could be patented that will do what THC does and then get it on label for something and you know, become the next blockbuster drug. So a lot of these compounds have been developed in legitimate labs and most of them didn't really work out commercially. So that's why you know, we're not getting them in like wonderful packages and being delivered as FDA approved therapeutics. But then the actual formulas found themselves out into the wild and people are making these compounds and selling them. So it's not derived from cannabis. In no way, shape, or form does it come from a plant. Constituents and doses can vary greatly. Again, you go to a dirty little shop and buy a dirty little bag of some dirty stuff from a dirty little guy and then you're shocked because you didn't get the product you thought you were getting. Oh well. You just can't trust people anymore. Synthesized in labs and formulated to interact with endogenous cannabinoid receptors. So these drugs work on the cannabinoid receptor the way THC does and so much more. And over 400, and I've even heard more like 900 of these compounds exist. So you're not going to find it on a test. Mechanism of action, very, very similar to marijuana because it works on the cannabinoid receptor. Decreased GABA, increased glutamate and dopamine. In addition, there may be serotonin, other things going on with glutamate. So what we need to know is that it works on the cannabinoid receptor. What's the difference? Marijuana contains cannabidiol, which does have some promise as an antipsychotic, and some people have suggested that that's why when people smoke marijuana, they might be a little less likely to have psychotic side effects because the cannabidiol is actually treating them while they're doing it. Synthetic cannabinoids don't have that. Uh, partial agonist at cannabinoid one. So based on what we know about partial agonists, no matter how much THC you get in your system, it's going to plateau. It's only going to do so much. Whereas, this is a full agonist. So we can keep using these synthetics. This one, HU210, is one of you know, more than several hundred, 400, maybe more. HU stands for Hebrew University because that's where it was synthesized. Full agonist, so it just doesn't stop getting more and more and more and more as they keep using it. And 800 times greater affinity. So it locks onto that receptor, it doesn't let go, and it has a full agonist. So it's doing much, 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 much more than regular cannabis is going to do. So I never really imagined in my clinical career that I would ever look someone in the eye and say, can't you just smoke dope like a civilized person? <laughs> but once we start seeing the synthetic cannabinoids out there, trust me, you'll start feeling it too. Like, come on, just weed. It won't mess you up at least not as much. What to look for? Agitation, alteration of time perception, anxiety, depression, dysphoria, elevated blood pressure, listlessness. It's kind of the end of the day, so some people might be feeling that way now. Nausea, paranoia, seizures, suicidal thoughts, and up to 40% of users. And this is kind of referring to actual intoxication, not later on sequelae. So people can become suicidal when they're using this in the moment. Tachycardia, and these symptoms are typically lasting up to six hours, you know, when they're intoxicated on this drug. 
detection and treatment. So based on those symptoms and knowing that commercial testing is available, but again, there's more than 400, maybe more like 900, and they're changing all the time. So this is a send out lab, just like we were talking about with bath salts. And there are so many compounds out there that even when you send it out and you get it back, there's a very good chance that they were still using synthetic cannabinoids and it just wasn't on the list yet of whatever lab you sent it to was looking for. So spice intoxication should be suspected in any patient presenting with bizarre behavior, anxiety, agitation, and or psychosis who has no known psychiatric history. Again, just like bath salts. And once again, the wonderful Dr. Swift had a poster where she and some others are working on developing a symptom set to look for when you're trying to detect spice or K2 or synthetic cannabinoid because again, there's no lab test. Really, I mean, nothing that you can use in the moment, and it might not even do any good later. So this is a clinical diagnosis, and once again, a diagnosis of exclusion. Intravenous benzos are most commonly gonna be used for agitation and seizures. The long-term consequences, again, relatively unknown, because it hasn't been around long enough to see what happens in 20 years. Spice might cause recurrence or exacerbation of pre-existing psychotic symptoms. So if someone is already predisposed to psychosis, then spice might really cause some problems. There may be a three times risk of subsequent psychosis. And 30% of users have had persistent psychosis at eight month follow-up. Now, that's a study that was pretty small, so the real answer is not much is known yet, but with the small studies that exist, yeah, up to a third of people eight months later still had persistent psychosis. I've actually seen this clinically. The other interesting thing about there is that the psychosis really does seem to look different. So you see psychotic symptoms. What I've seen clinically is not so much on the positive symptom side. What I have seen is very, very much on the negative symptom side. Very, very bad cognitive deficits. Uh, I actually took care of a young man in San Diego that they admitted after he shut down the turbines um, on Abraham Lincoln, which was kind of interesting. They called me in the middle of the night and these were not Navy people who called me, so I thought they shut down the reactor, uh, which would have been an FBI thing, you know, not a psychiatry thing. But actually, he just shut down the turbines and when I got to come see him in the hospital, the poor kid couldn't speak. So he was so badly cognitively disabled, he saw me, jumped to attention, so he remembered his manners as a sailor, and then was unable to get out more than about one word. And then the saddest thing I've ever seen in my life, we actually had the little tear coming down the side with utterly flat affect. No, he never ever displayed any kind of hallucination. There was never a sign that he was t attending to any kind of internal stimuli. But after I treated him as aggressively as I could with antipsychotic medications, not having any idea what else to do because nothing else exists, we got him to where he could reliably go to the chow hall and come back. Um, he could dress himself, he could shower, but he was unable to interact with any kind of normal affect. And that was after, I'd say a minimum of six weeks. So then based on that data, you know, I was the inpatient guy, so I didn't see him after that, but there's a very good chance that he wasn't much better a year later either. Depression, suicidal ideation may persist in these patients, and there have been some evidence of reduced hippocampal and amygdala volumes. So there is some sign of a degenerative process, and there are alterations in emotional processing and cognitive functioning. That's also something that we're seeing clinically in my program now, when I either suspect or I know that people have abused spice in the past, and there are some people that I'm, I'm quite certain that they used to be smarter and that they seem to have some cognitive deficits. And I'm hoping that someday you know, we'll be able to start testing that and be able to measure people against some kind of baseline. Kidney failure has been reported in several cases. I don't really know where that comes from. And again, with a drug like this, you have no idea what else you're smoking or what else you're eating because it didn't really have an appropriate label. So it kind of could have been anything. Dependence and withdrawal have been reported.